Good morning and welcome to everyone. Glad to be here again. I enjoyed that song. You know, um, David talked about dwelling in the house of the Lord. We don't have a house of the Lord. We come to a physical building to meet, but the reality is we are the house of the Lord. And am I dwelling, am I allowing God to dwell in me and am I living in communion with him? I think is the challenge that we, that we need to think about today. So we're ready to talk about part three in our sermon series on intentional use of technology. This is um, godly use of technology we're going to be talking about this morning. So um, if you haven't had the opportunity to hear the other sermons in this part, I w- uh, in this series, I would encourage you to do so. I think it would help you understand a little bit how we got to this point. And we're going to look at four areas of, uh, in, in the sermon this morning and when we talk about using technology in a godly way. We're going to talk about using technology to spread the gospel, how it's been used and how we can do that briefly. And it's important that we use it as a tool. This is not a toy box. And we should also use it with temperance. And we need to be intentional uh, in our use of it. I think that's where we'll spend most of our time talking about that this morning. So first of all, a little look about how technology has been used to spread the gospel. God's people have always been, were early adopters of an alphabet. Was was brand new technology in Moses' day. And because he would have grown up in the Egyptian court and they had pictographs. In other words, they had a symbol for every word. And the problem with that is that it was very difficult to learn because there's hundreds or thousands of symbols you need to learn. You need to learn a symbol for every single word. And it puts reading or literacy out of reach of most people unless you're going to really, really dedicate an incredible amount of time to learn how to read or write. And around the time of Moses, the alphabet was invented historians debate whether Moses himself perhaps invented the alphabet or whether he learned it somewhere else and adapted it to Hebrew, but Hebrew was one of the very first languages that had an alphabet. It didn't, uh, just a note of interest, it didn't have any vowels, it only had consonants, so it was a little interesting to read, but um, it was, it was the one of the first alphabets. But clearly, one way or the other, there was a written way for Moses to write down God's law when he got the law at Mount Sinai. And God's people have used written language to admonish, encourage, warn, teach, and evangelize throughout history. Um, Paul was a, was a, um, did a lot of writing, we know, in addition to using the Roman road network to spread the gospel, traveling ex- extensively by ship. He also used writing. He was very prolific in his writing. And apparently he also studied books as well. He said to Timothy, when you come, bring the cloak which I left at Troas with Carpus and the books, especially the parchment. So it seems like he was not only writing, but he was also studying writings of other people. We don't know exactly what these were, maybe Old Testament, maybe just writings of other early church leaders as well. And we talked about a few weeks ago about how the printing press was a big part of spreading the gospel. Not only were Bibles printed, but there were tracts and hymn books, all kinds of things. The printing press was in many ways the cornerstone of the Reformation. And then as cars became more affordable, early itinerant preachers traveled around rural America, and I'm sure other parts of the world as well, preaching the gospel. Bush planes were used to take missionaries to places that were hard to reach and take the gospel where it had never been before. Voice of the Martyrs used shortwave radio to transmit gospel messages into places in the world where it wasn't allowed. And to this very day, they're still transmitting the gospel into North Korea where it's very difficult to get any other way. And there are people who listen there, and it's a way for seekers to find more out about God. And it's been very effective. Digital Bibles are making a big difference in China where it's, it's challenging to get a lot of copies of written Bible. There are a lot of Chinese Christians who are able to read the Bible digitally who wouldn't have access to it otherwise. Pilgrim Ministries, I am impressed with, with the ministry that they have. They, uh, they have a, a, a put a lot of effort into their website and putting out sermons and, 
music, all kinds of different things, and especially during the pandemic, they saw a huge rise in users and people listening to the sermons, that sort of thing, when people weren't going to church otherwise. So um, that was a way that they were able to minister and give the full gospel to a lot of people who I believe were Christians, but maybe heard a partial gospel where modern evangelicals weren't giving out the whole gospel and it was an opportunity to spread the, spread the word. Churches use social media to put out the gospel in many different ways. Our church, you know, puts the sermons online, live streams them. It's a, it's a, it's a, um, a way for people to hear the gospel. And I think you should be using technology to share the gospel in whatever o- ways and opportunities you have. You can share sermons. You can call and encourage people. You can listen to the Bible as you work. You can listen to sermons. There's just a lot of different ways that you can use it personally. Point number two is use it as a tool. And I would like to use the illustration of a chainsaw. Technology is very useful. I'm very glad to have a chainsaw, but I would want, never want to use it without proper precautions because it's dangerous. And we need to think about the way that we use a chainsaw and think about that perhaps as we use technology. Um, I'm not afraid of a chainsaw, but I respect it and I'm careful with it. And I wouldn't give it to a four-year-old. And when I do teach my children to use a chainsaw, I'm going to be very intentional about that. Do they have the ability? And I'm going to oversee them when they first use it, and I'm going to make sure they know how to be careful and uh, you know, think about that before I just let my children use a chainsaw. Another illustration is of technology as a tool. You know, I have a toolbox with all my tools in it, but I don't tote that around with me all the time. I tend to you know, carry this little tool in my pocket, and it does lots of different things for me. And that's a little bit like our phones are. They can do lots of different things. They can be useful. But I I mostly use this as a tool and not a toy. And I might, you know, as I'm talking, mindlessly fiddle with it in my pocket or whatever. But I'm for sure not going to be mindlessly running my finger up and down the the serrated blade, right? You know, we say, well, that would be stupid. We wouldn't do that. Um, And I'm afraid our phone, we, we might mindlessly do some things that are just as dangerous if we're not thinking about it. And so we need to be intentional. We need to think of it as a tool and, and use it that way. So just think of how useful it can be and also how dangerous it can be. And then point number three is use it with temperance. And the Bible has a lot to say about temperance. So I want to read a few things. And in Solomon has quite a bit to say about temperance in regards to food. But I think these can apply, these lessons that he's using can apply broadly, and let's use it to our, think about it in relation to our use of technology. He says, have you found honey? Eat only what you need, that you not have it in excess and vomit it. When you sit down to dine with a ruler, so assuming you're, you're coming to someone's place and he has lots of food, Consider carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you are a man of great appetite. Do not desire his delicacies, for it is deceptive food. So I think we all know what the temptation to gluttony is, and we face that temptation. And hopefully most of us have learned to manage that temptation well. Maybe we need to go on a diet. Maybe there are certain things we shouldn't eat, or maybe there are certain things we shouldn't eat too much of. But... In the same way, do we realize our weakness in regards to technology, and do we set proper limits and diet, perhaps, on that? And Solomon really goes all out. He says, put a knife to your throat. He said, you need to be really serious about not eating too much, and you need to be really serious about using technology with temperance and not allowing it to, not, not being gluttonous in regards to that. And then Paul in the New Testament says, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. So he's using the illustration of someone who's competing in the Greek Olympics. And then a little later he says, I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified. So we can be a slave to technology or we can discipline ourselves and make it serve us. Which is it? Are we disciplining ourselves? Are we using proper self-control, or are we just being a slave to technology? And I think we talked about that a little bit in the past. And then I'd like to spend most of my time on our fourth point, 
sort of be intentional on practical ways that we can walk out using technology with wisdom and how we can do that. And I, there's, there's a, couple things that, a couple things that I'd like to look at in this area is humbly admit our weakness because we all have weaknesses and we need to acknowledge those. And then we need to set up appropriate boundaries for ourselves to deal with those weaknesses. We should also be respectful of the boundaries of other people. And we need to guard children and immature Christians from the damage that they can face uh, through the dangers of technology. So Romans 14, I was going to read a few verses, but I, I just think we're just going to go ahead and read that whole chapter because there's so much there. And of course, Paul isn't talking about smartphones because that wasn't the practical thing they faced. Um, but he was talking about weak Christians, strong Christians, and some of the guardrails that some of them had set up because of their weaknesses. And he's talking a little bit about what they would eat, um, how they observed holidays, things like that. But I think th this whole chapter is very, very applicable. So let's, let's think about that as we go through that, as we read through the chapter, Romans chapter 14. Now, accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. He's saying, welcome a weak Christian into your congregation, but don't, but don't be passing judgment on him. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats. We can apply this, you know, maybe, maybe you need... Um, well, we'll talk a little bit about, about what different guardrails, but don't look down on someone who needs some extra guardrails more than you do. And don't look down on someone who doesn't need those and is strong enough without them. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord. For he gives thanks to God, and he who eats not for the Lord he does not eat and gives thanks to God. For not one of us lives for himself, and not one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. If we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. But why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each one of us will give account of himself. So we're, we need to give account for ourselves and our use of technology. We're not responsible for everybody else and how they use it. Therefore, let us not judge one another any more, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And he's not saying impurity or sin is okay, but he's saying some of us need some guardrails. Uh, in this case, the person with the weak conscience, it bothered his conscience to eat meat because perhaps it had been offered to idols. But, so he's not in any way excusing sin and saying that impurity or pornography or anything like that is okay. He's just saying, that, so, so I think that that's just important to, for that to be clear. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then, we pursue the things which make for peace and building up of one another. Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean, but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. Or in other words, someone who it requires him to violate his conscience. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves, but he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he is eating not from faith, and whatever is not from faith is sin. 
So in the church group I would have grown up in, it was considered that whoever had the, the strongest convictions or the most guardrails for themselves was the holiest person. The most barriers in your life, the more spiritual you were. And I don't think that's the truth. But my problem is I tend to react to that, which is also not right. I need to be humble and willing to admit my weaknesses and where I need some guardrails because of spiritual weakness in my, in my life. And just because... I need those guardrails don't mean that everyone else does. One brother might need to have a very strong filter because that is a weakness. It, it keeps him from falling into sin. One sister might need an app on her phone to keep her from wasting too much time on it. Um, maybe your son needs to be accountable to a mentor to make sure that he's using technology in a good way. Respect those things, encourage them, but mostly be humble and realize what you need and be humble enough to admit that. And there are a lot of guardrails. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but you can have an app to limit how much time you spend on your phone. You can have an app to hopefully limit bad content, but you need to re remember that there is no technology solution that is perfect. If you put that filter on your phone, you can take it off and you can get around it and your children can definitely get around it if they, just, if they really want to. So you've got to start with a filter on the heart. And maybe you need some other helps, but it's got to start with the heart. And I think one, as far as re relating to your children, one of the most important things is have an open relationship with them. Talk to them about their use of technology. Uh, for young children, be with them when they're using a screen or technology in any way. Because children are very adept at and they're very curious. They will find things that you didn't think they could find. Um, not necessarily intentionally, but it's very important to be very vigilant about what our children are exposed to, especially pornography and that sort of thing, because of how damaging it is and how addictive it is. We need to spend time talking with your children about that kind of thing at a much younger age than you would think. The average child has seen pornography by the age of 12, and a decent amount have seen it at 10 or younger. Not necessarily because they're seeking it out, it's because it's available. And, and it can be curiosity, it can be a friend, a relative, so we need to have these conversations with our children. I would like to define pornography, um, so I know what we're talking about, and I don't mean to be explicit or say things that would cause people to stumble, but I think we need to be honest and open about this kind of thing. Pornography is sexually explicit videos, photographs, writings, or the like, whose purpose is to arouse sexual excitement. Or simpler for maybe younger children, pictures of people not wearing enough clothes, or just bad pictures. And there's a whole continuum of what this can be, of how explicit it is. But the reality is it's all very damaging and very addictive. And when it's hard, for, it's, it's bad for all of us, but when young children encounter it, I think it's even worse. They have, they're not at all equipped to handle it, and the devil doesn't play fair. He's, he tricks people who, who don't understand, and there's this mix of pleasure and guilt that they can't understand. They don't know what to do with, and when they don't have someone they can talk to about it that's been open with them about it, they don't have anywhere to go with it. So be honest. Talk to them about it. Tell your children what to do when they see it, or if they see it, but probably when. It's sad to say, but probably when. And don't make it a thing where you condemn them or shame them. It is a shameful thing, but many times it's not their fault that they've seen it and weren't looking for it. Um, just some simple things to give them is tell them to get out of the situation, close the tab, turn the phone off, walk away from the person who showed it to you, whatever it takes, get out of the situation. Don't let it continue to suck you in. And then tell somebody about it. If it's a, your child, ask them to talk to you about it. Talk to your spouse about it. Talk to your mentor about it. But tell someone about it because the darkness of, even if, if you were completely innocent and in seeing, you didn't look for it, if you keep that quiet, it's, it remains powerful. It's going to hold a grip on you. If you're willing to confess it and be open and honest and allow light into that situation, you can win a victory. It doesn't have nearly the hold on you if you've been open and honest about it. And... Tell your spouse about it. You know, that it, it, it ironically, it, it, 
it's kind of counterintuitive, but it can build trust when you have that level of transparency, whether it was something you did purposefully or not, be honest and open with your spouse about that. And, you know, we think of this problem as a thing that young men face, and it probably is, maybe they are the most vulnerable, but everyone is susceptible to this. And so let's, let's remember that. So speak to your, your sons and your daughters about it. Now let's see what the Bible has to say. Proverbs 7, Solomon is talking to his sons, and he is talking to them about an example of a real-life prostitute. And, but um, really, I think it's very applicable to pornography that we face today, many of the same things. But, and we can go through this and like, oh, wow, this is awful, it's terrible, and yes, it is. But in the first couple of verses, there's something very important. There's hope. And I think there's kind of two or three things that give us hope against this dark sin. Wisdom and obedience can help you avoid this, or at least help you avoid having it, letting it have a hold in your life. So listen, I'm going to read the whole chapter again, because I think there's so much here, and I'll make some comments as we go through. My son, keep my words and treasure my commandments within you. Keep my commandments and live. And my teaching is the apple of your eye. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call understanding your intimate friend, that they may keep you from an adulteress, from the foreigner who flatters with her words. For at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice, and I saw among the naive. So Solomon is sitting in his house, and he watched this happen, it seems, out his window. And this young man is naive. He's not looking for this. He's not, he has no evil intent. He just isn't equipped to handle what's about to happen. A young man lacking, I discern, and, and discerned among the youths, a young man lacking sense. This is not a bad man. He's just not a man who's, who's learned what he should have, whose parents taught him what he should have. Passing through the street near her corner. So he's just walking along, doing his life. And he takes the way to her house. He just happens to walk by this lady's house. And isn't that true of how people encounter bad things online, pornography or whatever it might be? Just walking along, not looking for it, not intending to. In the twilight, in the evening, in the middle of the night, and in the darkness, and behold, a woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot and cunning of heart. So she's out to destroy him. And you can watch as we continue to read what she says. It's lies. It's full of lies. It's not true. She's out for her own gain, to gain money probably, and nothing else. Just look at all the lies she tells to him. She is boisterous and rebellious. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the squares, and lurks by every corner. So she seizes him and kisses him. This element of surprise, and I think that's another power that, that these kind of dark things have. The element of surprise, we're not prepared, and she seizes him. He didn't see it coming, and so he was not at all. Again, another reason he wasn't, wasn't prepared. And with a brazen face, she says to him, I was due to offer my peace offerings. Today I have paid my vows. This sounds wonderful, right? She's this religious person, right? That's what she's saying, at least. Therefore, I have come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly. I have found you. Th this sort of false sense of desire. She wants him. She cares about him, and it's just a lie. She wants to destroy him. I have spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt. I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses. For my husband is not at home. He has gone on a long journey, and he has taken a bag of money with him. At the full moon, he will come home. With her many persuasions, she entices him. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. It's all flattery. It's not true. It's a lie. And then we see the results. And this is... I think if we can see the results of what this kind of thing does, we're a lot more equipped to handle it. What's going to happen? Suddenly he follows her as an ox goes to the slaughter, or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool, until an arrow pierces through his liver, and as a bird hastens to the snare, so he does not know that it will cost him his life. Now, therefore, my sons, listen to me and pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Do not stray into her paths. Find yourself straying around the internet. It's a good way to run, come across something that's not good. For many are her vict of the victims she has cast down, and numerous are all her slain. Her house is the way to Sheol, or hell, descending to the chambers of death. And that's one of the ways that temptation in general gets us. 
Satan puts this beautiful thing in front of us and doesn't show us the result. No matter how good she looks, she's leading you to destruction. And I want to reinforce again what the beginning of the chapter says. Wisdom, obedience, and intentionality can help you avoid these problems. Don't start down that road. Satan has a plan to destroy you, but God has a plan to restore you. And so I want to, you know, it sounds horrible, and it is horrible, but I want to give hope because it's not a given that we're going to continue down that path. No matter where you are on that path, there is hope. You can turn around. You can change. And Jeremiah had this to say. He was warning of destruction and how the, the, is, the Judah was going to get carried away into Babylon and all these things. But there's these verses in Jeremiah 29, 11 to 14 where he gives these people hope. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for calamity, to give you a future and hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back to the place where I sent you into exile. And so I want to really continue to give that hope out to anybody if you are anywhere in that process. There is hope. So in conclusion, a little bit of review. Godly people will use technology to spread the gospel. They'll use it as a tool. They'll use it in moderation. And they're going to be intentional in how they use technology. And if you feel trapped, get help. There is help. Technology can be used in a godly way. Maybe you've been convicted that there's some areas of technology you're too weak to use without some guardrails, or maybe you're too weak to use it at all. Listen to God's promptings. Don't ignore that. Maybe you haven't talked to your children about the dangers of technology, pornography, and prepared them for that. Be willing to do that. Maybe you and your family need some helpful guardrails in your life. Maybe you just haven't been intentional about it. Maybe you haven't put much thought into it. I would challenge you, seek God and obey him. God bless you.